uploading videos. I don't know if you can see that or not. <laughs> um, so welcome back. We talked about the origins of agriculture and now we want to think about the implications of agriculture. And we're going to address two questions, test two hypotheses related to agriculture. The first revolves around religion and the other one revolves around but the spread of agriculture is it sp is agriculture spread by cultural dispersal knowledge dispersal or is it spread by people so we'll look at both of those so now let's go forward to thinking about the fertile crescent now this is where we were before thinking about the domestication of wheat and you actually saw what that archaeological evidence um, looks like, well, one of the pieces of archaeological evidence. Now, thinking about those larger implications of what agriculture means for human culture, I wanted to put up this um, hypothesis that was presented by an archaeologist back in 2000 in, in the journal Science. And in this, the archaeologist suggested that, that the accumulation of surplus food supplies enabled that agriculture brings with it, that that enables large settlements to be established, which results in the emergence of Western civilization. And this has been, um, he was fully seeing a, an idea that had been held for a while that you have to have agriculture in order to be able to have the food resources to support a lot of people kind of higher up in a social structure. And so in order to have people like me sitting here teaching at a university, you have to have people who can produce more food than they need than they need to get by in a year so that then people like me can buy that food and do other activities and be provided um, with with resources to survive and that only agriculture can really do that at a, in a at a large scale so we're going to test two hypotheses as i mentioned let's look at the first one the first one is which came first agriculture or massive temples because one idea is that in order to have massive temples you have to have agriculture to enable to provide the food resources for people to spend for a lot of people to spend a lot of time and energy building something massive so do you need the surplus food that comes with agriculture in order to be able to take on the public works projects that are associated with temples and cities etc now anecdotally it kind of looks like that um, for a long time it looked like that was the case so for example think about stonehenge moving these giant giant stones that that are massively heavy that people needed to all work together. You needed a lot of people in a very coordinated fashion over a long period of time to put together something like this. And that is what we see that with Stonehenge in about 5,000 years ago, the people who put this together, they were agriculturalist. And so there was this pattern that we were finding that with the rise of agriculture and the spread of agriculture, that you saw these monolithic, these, these big endeavors of construction coming along with them. And so that looked to be the case. But it's a hypothesis, and that means that data can always, new data can always reject the hypothesis. And that is what happened with the discovery of this archaeology site in Turkey, Gobekli Tepe. So it dates to about 11,500 years ago. So it is, it precedes the um, sort of agriculture on this larger scale. It's 7,000 years before the pyramids of Europe. It's 6,000, this is 6,000 years before Stonehenge. And the thing about the site that's really fascinating is that they built these really large um, megalithic uh, structures so big circles of stone the biggest one was about 30 yards across the pillars the stone pillars are 17 feet tall they have about four different temples um, they know at this site they've done a lot of work by looking um, at um, being able to, to use sonar to figure out what's underneath the ground and they know that there's about 15 to 20 of them that are still under the ground so these were hunter-gatherer people and yet they had come together to build these giant structures that they don't have an immediately obvious purpose for procuring food or hunting for hunting animals or, or anything like that. They're, they're clearly symbolic of something much larger and it required big groups of people to do it. So this 
Göbekli Tepe then rejects that hypothesis that you had to have agriculture before you could have these, these more um, elaborate types of cultural expression. So keep that in mind. And now let's go to the second big question that is often asked about agriculture. So did agriculture spread or did the people who practiced agriculture spread? <laughs> so what's the genetic relationship between the hunter-gatherer people across Eurasia and the agriculturalists who came after them? So what influence did agriculture have on the genetic variation across Western Eurasia? And so we're going to look at a study that was published in 2019 that showed that the movement of people following the advent of farming resulted in genetic gradients across Eurasia. These can be modeled as mixtures of seven um, deeply divergent populations. Let me show you this study. So this is from, um, um, like I said, 2019, and Narash, Narasiman et al., uh, they looked at 523 ancient genomes that span about 8,000 years. They're mostly derived from Central Asia and the northernmost part of South Asia. And let's look at these clines because they were able to put them together with other ancient genomes that have been studied. So these are the ancestry clines um, from dates, from sites, um, from people who were alive um, um, before 7,000 years ago. So they're from times greater than 7,000 years ago, these ancient genomes. You've seen these pie charts before when we were looking at mitochondrial DNA variation. And so you're, you're familiar with this idea of looking at allelic variation in pie chart form. And so what they're showing here is in these different populations, these different, these different ancestry. Remember they had mentioned that there are seven of them, and there are seven represented in these different colors on these pie charts. As you're looking at the geography, notice that you have a clinal change, a gradual change in the colors that are represented in those pie charts. So go all the way to the west, so looking at the Iberian Peninsula, and you have just blue and orange in that pie chart, where the blue is taking up about 25% about of the pie chart, and the orange takes up about 75%. Go north and look into um, the region up there, where you have, again, roughly speaking, a very similar proportionality of, of alleles, of, of genetic variation, as you see down in the Iberian Peninsula. Move a little bit east, a little bit less of that blue, and that blue is represented um, it's it's indicating ancestry with those Western European hunter-gatherer populations in that orange. Let your eyes follow that across on the lower part of the, the geographic lower part of the map. And notice that that orange is part of this South Eurasian climb. These are hunter, these are agriculturalists. So you, we can see from this evidence then that the agriculturalists moved but they didn't entirely replace the hunter-gatherers that were there in the region in Europe before, but they mixed with them. But they have a pretty dominant effect. But the hunter-gatherers were not eradicated. They were brought into and they, they clearly um, meshed in genetically with the agriculturalists as agriculture spread across into Europe. So then that rejects the hypothesis that, um, that, that agriculturalists completely replaced hunter-gatherers and rather demonstrates that, that you have this meshing of cultures and you have this meshing of people. Notice also that we have that cline um, at the top. Um, so we will be looking at them pretty soon. And with that, I'm really not very good at this music thing. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> this is why people have producers. <laughs> All right. See you in the next video.